uh, two lectures left. Uh, reminder, your assignments are due either today. Uh, if you didn't slip on the first uh, assignment, you can hand it in on Friday uh, by noon. You might as well do that uh, because uh, you can't use your slip day for anything else. And uh, what else? Um, okay, so course evaluations. Uh, this is something they suspended for a while, uh, but they're redoing it now uh, because of, uh, they suspended it because of COVID, I don't know why. But anyways, uh, they're, they're now open again. Um, so this is a chance for you to give feedback on the course, on me as an instructor, anything you wanna see. I do read them, I take them seriously. A lot of the things that I do is because of course evaluations. So in the early days, I would just teach on a whiteboard. And Suen said, well, it's hard. We have to come and get a copy of the notes. And you're always like facing the board, not facing the class. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll go out and get a digital thing and then I'll, I'll write them. Then I can give you a PDF. And then since I'm in front of my laptop, why don't I just record the audio? And then students are like, well, you know, the audio is great, but like, I don't know where you are in the notes when you're talking and it's kind of hard. So then I'm like, okay, I'll screen record it. I'll put it on YouTube. And some students are like, I want to get into the Moodle to see your, your lectures before the course starts. And I can't do that because uh, I can't just grant people access to Moodle, but I'll put them on YouTube and then you can. And so anyways, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that I, I do, everything I do is because students sometime like ask me to change something. And uh, obviously I give it consideration and, and things like that, but uh, I do adapt to it. So don't think that it doesn't mean anything. So if you have uh, something that you think would make the course better, uh, give it, leave it in the course evaluation and, and it won't help you personally, but it will help the students that take this course in two, three years, uh, perhaps, yeah. Okay, uh, and then uh, I believe they're due December 7th. Uh, so that's more or less next class and uh, the instructions I just posted on Moodle, you probably got an email about it as well. And so do it for all of your courses, please, and thank you. Okay, uh, is there questions about anything else? Yeah. Yeah, project. Okay, so projects do last day of class. When's the last day of class? When is the last day of class, though? Next week, okay, so everyone has seven days. Your projects are gonna be done in seven days? No. <laughs> no, okay, okay. Um, okay, so I, I am open to extending it. Uh, what do you guys want? When do you wanna do? Okay, so the problem, the problem with giving you an extension is that you're, you think that your lives will become less busy, but they won't right? Because you're going to have finals probably for a bunch of other courses and you'll have projects and things like that, right? So uh, I do encourage you to, to try and keep next week in mind and, and, and try and do as much as you can uh, before next week because it's, it's not going to get better. Um, so the exam is on the 21st, so that's two weeks after the last day of class. Now because it's so late this year, I would like to mark the projects before I mark your exams. Otherwise it's you have to understand that projects take a long time to mark. That there's a reason you only get eight pages. It's because you know eight times 100 students, that's 800 pages or whatever. Now I know people work in groups and it's not quite 100 and things like that, but uh, it's still like reading a textbook every year. Um, so yeah, so I don't know. I'm open to suggestions. How long would you think it would take to mark 500 pages? For me, two days. So two days is a little, little conservative. Yeah. So a week I can easily do. Yeah. So do, do people like the sound of December fourteenth? So I'll give you an extra week. Yeah. All in favor? Okay. I see it. Anyone not in favor? Okay. All right. Okay. So December fourteenth it is. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll update the Moodle. Let me do it now before I forget. Now, technically, I'm not allowed to accept projects during exams, and so uh, that hasn't stopped me before, but I will word it as uh, it's still due next week, but I will not penalize you for handing it in any time before December 14th. So there'll be no penalty for handing it in.
and you can submit it any time of the day. I don't, I don't care. You can submit it at midnight. And if it's midnight and, you know, you didn't do your references or whatever because you saved it till the end and you're like, can I, you know, is he going to go on at midnight and download all the projects? And, uh, and I, I, I'm going to hand it in at 3 a.m. instead. Um, the answer is no, I will not be up at midnight downloading the projects. Um, so try and get it to me by, by the, the time I wake up on December 15th, we'll say. And if, if, if even if that's not doable, you can always email me and, and plead your case. Uh, Okay, I will, uh, I'll make a note, I'll put it in the lecture notes, uh, this may be the best. The, my Safari today's been kind of weird, I think I need to reboot my computer. Yeah. Okay, good question. Let me, let me, uh, let me come back to that, I'll answer that question in a sec. And all the people that aren't in class, you don't have to tell them about this. Until like maybe give them a couple days to figure it out. Uh, except until Wednesday, December 4th, what time? Okay, so in terms of the assignment itself, as long as you get it to me somehow, it will get marked. Okay, that you're not gonna like get a zero because you didn't follow the instructions correctly. But that said, I do, it makes my life a lot easier uh, if you follow the instructions for how to submit it. Um, so it's, it's taking a while to load. So uh, if you're working in a, a group, uh, I would prefer actually just to get a single PDF. I don't care who uploads it. I, you know, I just pull them all down. I'm going to look at the file names and I'm going to open the PDF. I lose track of who even submitted it. So it literally doesn't matter who submits it in the group. Don't think that that means you're like the more dominant uh, partner or something like that. Um, so it doesn't matter. It would be useful if you could put your student numbers in the title of the PDF itself. Because I get a lot of like project.pdf and then I put them all in a folder and then it's like you have seven projects.pdf, like do you want to overwrite them all? Um, so it, it, it would give you a unique, your file name will be unique and then I can see also all the student numbers. Uh, definitely have, have it uh, on a title sheet as well. Uh, so names, student numbers are a lot easier for me to enter your grades rather than names themselves. Names are, are good too, uh, but having your student ID there is good. And um, if you need to overwrite it, that's fine. So I, I'll look at like the most recent version. So on EAS, you can keep submitting new versions and then it will, uh, it keeps your old versions visible. Uh, but it, uh, but anyways, we'll, we'll just, I'll mark like the last version of it. I personally will mark the project, so the TA marks the assignments, including assignment two, uh, but uh, I, the projects are 100% marked by me and the exam is 100% marked by me. I don't use the TA. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Um, you won't get your grade back on the project, you'll just get a final grade, uh, but in, the, in January, like in the next term, uh, you can come, you can email me or whatever, uh, and uh, you can, or you can just come to my office hours, which I'll have next term for my, my other courses. Uh, and you're free to obviously see a uh, breakdown of your, your grade, what you got on each uh, feedback on the project. Uh, feedback's very minimal because there's so many of you, I can't like highlight and take notes and things like that. I read them very quickly. Uh, so I'll just give you like a grade and like some justification for the grade. Uh, it won't be extensive feedback. 
Uh, sometimes students want to try and publish their projects, and so then that's fine. Then I'll, I'll look at it again in more detail. So I'll, you can ask me, hey, I really like my project. Uh, could you give me more feedback on it? And then I might do a, a greater read through. Or if you tell me ahead of time, I can do it on the first pass as well if I know that, that that's coming. Um, yeah, and, and your final exam too, you can, uh, in January, you can come back and, and you can see it. Uh, the exam itself I'll talk about more next week, but uh, generally it's mostly multiple choice uh, and short answer. Uh, so the multiple choice will be Scantron. Uh, so it will just be, you'll just fill it in with pencil uh, and then it's marked by machine. Uh, so I lied when I said I mark it. Uh, it's IBM marks it. Um, but uh, yeah, and then the short answer is obviously I mark. So I'll, I'll ask me next week about the exam and I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about like what kinds of questions you can expect and things like that. Okay, any questions about anything else? Or about the lecture? No. Okay. Let's see if I can quickly add this. Okay, so last class we uh, looked at airport policies. Uh, so we're going to extend that theme of looking at policies. Uh, this time we'll look at uh, a different policy, one that's more technical, implemented by the browser called the same origin policy. The dots seem bigger today for some reason. So technically, we're going to look at two policies. They're two separate things, but they're so close that you can kind of think of them as one. Uh, so one's the, the cookie policy of a browser, and the other's the same origin policy. Uh, both of them have to do with what website are you visiting, and uh, how much control should that website have over the page that you're, you're looking at. Uh, OK, so these policies, who decides them? OK, so is there like some organization that sits down and, and decides these things and so the answer is that these policies go back quite a way so they go back to the early 90s and or mid 90s and uh, they were just decided by developers at the time so there wasn't a big debate about what the policies should be they just sort of put them in place now over time these policies may evolve or there might be new you know security policies and frameworks and things added to browsers and for these, they might try to use a more open process. So there are a few kind of volunteer organizations where people who work on internet stuff can come together, like the IETF uh, comes to mind. Uh, there's one called, I think, W3C. Uh, and so they, they look at different things themselves. But um, OK. And like we'll see, uh, these are going to concern, the, the two that we look at anyway uh, concern web resources. And how they interact with.
basically other resources that are loaded on the same page. Okay, so all of the examples we're going to see, it's sort of like a website where you're pulling content from multiple places, and then the browser's trying to figure out, you know, how do, do I keep everything separate or do I allow them to interact? Um, and there's a tension because developers want things to be easy. So they prefer a more open world where everything just interacts with everything else. Then they don't have to think too hard about how do I configure the elements of these pages to, uh, to interact with each other. Okay, so developers prefer that. But security people, they don't want all the elements to interact with other elements because if one of the elements is malicious, then it could pot potentially do something bad uh, to, to the rest of, of it, okay? Um, to the rest of the, the resources on the page. So you have a kind of pendulum where you have people who want, you know, let's say ease of development and you have security. So the policy is like kind of trying to balance it. And a lot of the criticisms of the same origin policy was that it, it kind of prioritized ease of development over security kind of thing, okay? Um, so it was sort of more, more open uh, than, as opposed to, to, to um, in, ter in terms of segmenting or isolating uh, resources. Okay, so this is important in kind of like web 2.0 and, and beyond, where you started to see websites that weave together resources. I'll define what resources mean. You can think of it as content, but we mean specific things by resources. Uh, weave together resources from different sites, okay? Now, I'll, I'll throw in a more technical term here. Uh, you're weaving together, like if I, if I have a website and I have JavaScript that's coming from Google and I have a login like button from Facebook and things like that, so those are resources. They're coming to me from different websites, from different places, or the technical term is origins, okay? So they're coming to me from different origins. And that's why the same origin policy, uh, that's where the, that policy, the name of the policy has a meaning, uh, which is basically that it's going to concern whether things are from the same origin or are they from different origins? And what do you do in each cases, okay? Um, so the big question is how do you isolate resources. Okay, so you could think of kind of like you have a website and maybe there's like something called an iframe which we'll talk about and you know this is coming from say A and then you have like a frame and B is in charge of loading the frame. And then maybe you have some JavaScript or something. I'll try and draw it. That's supposed to be a gear, not a sun or a ladybug. Um, but you have some like sort of JavaScript or something that's, it's running inside of A, but it's pulled off of the website C. That's like where you can find it. And so like, is C allowed to change A? Can C go in and change what's in the iframe? Can B jump out of the iframe and change what's in A? You know, these are the kinds of questions that we want to we want to answer. Okay, so we can go back to the time to when these things came about. Um, so the earliest browser was called uh, Netscape Navigator. This company doesn't exist anymore. Kind of turned into Mozilla, or Mozilla kind of took over uh, their, their IP. So in some sense, Firefox is, is maybe a, a, a descendant of Netscape, but anyway. Back in the 90s, uh, this was like either around the time or slightly before Microsoft came out with Internet Explorer, which was the main competitor to Netscape. So there was a time when everyone used Netscape. If you want to use the web, you would download a browser or you would get a browser. I don't know where you get it from because you can't browse the internet. Um, so you get your browser on floppy disk, I guess, uh, and it would be Netscape Navigator. And then uh, Microsoft came along and said, okay, we're, we're gonna do our own browser, we're gonna put it in every copy of Windows. So you get a machine, it's running Windows, then you have our browser, it's right there, ready to go. 
then Netscape said, oh, that's, you can't do that. You're abusing your power because you have a kind of a monopoly on operating systems. So you can't just give your browser away for free. And then, you know, that resulted in all sorts of uh, lawsuits and things like that in the 90s. And eventually the ruling was that, that Microsoft could include it, but they would give you the option of installing some other browser if you wanted to. And that's kind of the precedent that we have. So most operating systems give you a browser, right? Apple will give you Safari. Microsoft will give you Internet Explorer. Android will give you Chrome. Uh, yeah, anyways. Okay, so in 94, they came up with a policy around something called cookies, which we'll talk about what they are and how they work. Uh, this will also maybe be helpful for your assignment. And hopefully you, you know a bit about cookies as a result of doing your assignment, assuming you've done it. Uh, and then uh, in 95, they followed up with the same origin policy. So this, it's basically the exact same policy. It just, this one concerns cookies and this one uh, concerns other web resources, but the most important is scripting. So like JavaScript and, and things like that. So when we talk about resources on a website, we mean all the things that you download uh, when you go and visit a website. Um, so a lot of them are, is like in the content of the website itself. <coughs> so you have your, like, you always start with some sort of HTML page. It might be like PHP or some other thing, but it's usually, um, or it could be HTML. We call this passive because it just displays things. Okay, it can't run code. It can, it can call things that will run code, but it in and of itself doesn't run code. Uh, other passive resources could be things like the images that you see, uh, video files, that kind of stuff. And then active content is more dangerous because it can be programmed to do arbitrary things. So JavaScript is the main thing that we see now. <coughs> Earlier, uh, you know, five, ten years ago, there was something called Flash that was used a lot. Um, Microsoft had its own kind of scripting thing called ActiveX. Uh, but these things are, are more or less dead. In fact, I think Flash is now disabled across all browsers. The iPhones, very controversially, when they came out, they did not allow Flash. And so uh, a lot of websites like YouTube used to be just pure Flash. And then uh, because the iPhone was such a big market, uh, YouTube couldn't afford to just like have all iPhone users not use their, their website. So they actually changed uh, to HTML5 and MP4. Uh, and then uh, the other thing you see a lot on the web that isn't obviously active content, but is often treated at, as is CSS. So CSS are files that would like set the fonts on a website or the layout or the menu bars and those kinds of things. And it should be like HTML. It should just be like, here's some passive like resources. But when they developed CSS, they gave more functionality to it so you could specify more complicated things. And eventually it kind of crossed the threshold where you could just ar arbitrarily execute code with it. So now, at least, yeah, traditionally it w it, it's been considered active content. Now maybe they've, they've changed it recently and, and kind of scaled back its functionality, but uh, people treat it that way. Okay, so this is the content of the website, okay? Now there's another element. When you're interacting with a website, you're downloading the content, and you're doing that through requests and responses. So I send a request, and I get the content, and then I downloaded it uh, as a response. It comes back to me as a response. But when my browser creates the request, or when the web server creates the response, they, it's like an envelope. So there's an envelope, they put the content, right? So the HTML, the JPEG, the CSS, whatever, they put that in the envelope, but then they write stuff on the outside of the envelope, okay? And that stuff can be important as well. Uh, so we call that meta information, or meta content is maybe a better, let me actually switch it. And so this is the, the sort of the headers 
in the uh, requests and responses for content. Okay, and the, the, the most important thing that's in the, meta, in the meta content that's not in the website itself is this uh, cookies. Okay, so cookies are not part, they're not part of the website. If you get a cookie from Facebook, it didn't come down inside the website itself. It's not in the content, it's not the cookies not in HTML or things like that. It's, uh, it's in the packet, uh, the response that came down, it's in the envelope, it's on the outside of the envelope, it's not on the content that's inside of it. Now, does that matter a lot? No, it doesn't really matter where it is, but anyways, just for the sake of completeness, that's, that is where it is. Okay, now, what we want is, so we want some po policy where, you know, we have a bunch of content uh, for this website and we have meta content as well, and we're deciding how they should interact, right? Uh, should they be isolated or should they not? So we want a policy that's going to give us answers to those questions. And uh, we have a few goals uh, in mind. So security goals. Like, wh wh why does this policy even matter? Uh, so the first goal, if we want to put it in terms of stride, uh, is there's some tampering attacks that we want to prevent. Okay, so basically, if I download a website and it looks like this, it, I want to, when I, my browser shows it to me, it should look like what A looked like when it was sent. It should look like what B was when it's sent, and it should look like what C was, okay? If C is able, if I download A and then B, it starts rendering the website, and then C comes in and says, I want to rewrite all of A and all of B and show them a completely different looking thing, right? We consider that tampering, okay? So uh, it would tamper uh, with, with A and B. So we, we want a policy that, that uh, basically what we see is what was sent by the website, what the, the person intended for us to see. Okay, the second kind of class of attack is information disclosure or privacy. And so like imagine for example, uh, well let's say you go to a website and there's a Facebook like button. So that means Facebook dumped that information into that website, okay? So I'm whatever, I'm on the Montreal Gazette and there's a Facebook like button. Does that mean that the Montreal Gazette knows all my Facebook friends? Okay, so we wouldn't want that, right? Now you could imagine a world where that might be the case, right? I'm, I'm on Facebook, I'm logged into Facebook. Maybe it's even showing me like 14 of your friends like this article, right? Uh, that, that could be the functionality that you could see, right? But we don't expect that Montreal Gazette then knows who those 14 friends are or who my friends are, okay? And conversely as well. Uh, if I go to that website, should Facebook know that I'm looking at a Montreal Gazette article? Should it know what article I'm looking at? Okay, so, so maybe we say yes, maybe we say no. Uh, let's say no, but anyways, we could write that down as a property, okay? We'll, we'll see how well browsers do uh, with these two goals, but anyway, this could definitely be the goal. Um, so what you... I'll frame it as what you're sending, but it can also be what sort of what you receive. Um, uh, let's actually, let me say what you exchange with one origin cannot be seen by another origin. Okay, so let's see how well we do uh, in terms of tampering, preventing tampering and information disclosure in the kinds of browser policies that, 
Netscape came up with in the 90s and are still with us today for better or for worse. So let's start with cookies. And I'll, I'll explain what a cookie is and, and all the basics. We won't just jump straight into the policy. So let me ask you the question, what, what's a cookie? What does it look like? Okay, so it's a piece of storage. Uh, so where is it stored and what's inside of it? Okay, so basically it's a storage of a number and that number is kind of like a unique identifier. Okay, so that's what's being stored is a unique identifier. Usually it's handed out per person or it could be a session within a single person. Okay, now who's storing it? Okay, so your browser stores it. Okay, who comes up, who dreams the number up in the first place? Does your browser dream it up? The server, okay, so it's a, it's a number that the server creates and it sends to your browser and it asks your browser to store it on your behalf. Okay, so it says, hey, you just came visited me. I, wanna, I want you to remember this number in the future. Okay, and then every time you go back to the same website, your browser will say, oh, did this website ever ask me to store anything in the past? And if it did and it finds it, then it will send it along with, with your request to the website, essentially. Okay, um, so let's, we'll, we'll write it down and draw it out because it's kind of confusing, but that's the high level. Okay, so cookies are just, they're numbers, they're values or numbers. And they're usually given a name. So we, we sometimes, if you wanna be fancy, you can call it a key value pair, but it's basically like a tag. Think of like a folder. So there's a, a unique name for what the folder name is. And then inside of it, there's the content, uh, which is just usually a number. with a name uh, and, uh, okay, so it's stored by your browser. It is set by the server. So the server chooses whether to set a cookie or not and what the value should be, what the name is and what the value is. It asks your browser to store it and then your browser basically will staple it in to any request. It will staple it into future requests to that server, but we have to go through the nitty gritty details of what does that mean to, to that server or not. Um, So let's say when, uh, so that, that's what the policy is going to decide. Okay, so the policy is going to be, okay, when I'm looking at this cookie, it was set, do I, do I actually include it or not, right? And what, what's my criteria for whether I include it or not? Okay, all of this stuff happens in the header. of uh, requests and response. So it's not in the content of the page. Okay, and why, why do cookies exist before I draw it out? Um, so there, there's a couple use cases that we go to uh, but the main one, the main reason they exist is, let's say I go and I log into my Gmail. So I go to the Gmail page, it says, okay, put your username password in. So I put in my username password, and then it authenticates me and it knows it's me. So then it shows me my inbox, right? So now I'm looking at my inbox and I see the very first email, I wanna read it. So I click on it. Now I'm gonna send a request back to Google to say, show me the first message in Jeremy Clark's inbox. How does Google know that I'm the same person? 
right? How do they know that, oh, like do they, they don't ask me to put in my username password again, right? They're like, okay, you wanna see the first email? Great, put in your username password again, and then if it's right, then I'll show you the first message. And then now you wanna look at the second message to so put in your username password again, okay? So how does it have that continuity of, okay, this person authenticated, I checked who they are, but I know it's the same person that's coming back, okay? And it can't be like IP address, right? Because lots of people could use the same IP address. We talked about not ad addressing and, you know, at Concordia, like everyone comes from the same gateway, okay? So it's not based on IP address. And even if I switch IP addresses, I go from Wi-Fi to 3G or whatever, uh, then 5G now, sorry. Uh, um, if I go to 5G, it's not like they make me re-authenticate. They, they might sometimes, right? Like if I hop on an airplane and I land in another country, then they might say, oh, that looks weird. Um, and they, they might make me re-authenticate, but it's not strictly necessary that they do. Okay, uh, so it's not based on IP address. Um, so what's it based on? It has to be based on something, right? And so that's the main application of cookies. Okay, so cookies are the technology that they're gonna use to basically ensure that I'm the same person uh, that, that I, I claim to be, okay? So what will happen is, let's say I, I go to Gmail for the first time, I'll send my request. Let's say I have a new browser, I just turned it on for the very first time. You can simulate this by opening private browser mode. So that's what private browser mode does, is it resets everything about your browser. It's just like you got an iPad and you bought it from the Apple Store and you're turning it on for the very first time and you just connected it to the internet for the first time. There's nothing, it's just a complete blank slate. You can also use Tor, which will give you anonymity, but it'll also give you that fresh uh, browser as well. Okay, so I'll send a request, any request to say google.com. And Google will say, hey, I've never seen this person before. This is a brand new person, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give them an identifier to, to, to sort of keep track of them. So if they ever come back to me again, I know that they're the same person. So this could be as simple as like, I type in my search results and then I hit enter and then it's going to show me the second page, the third page, and it, I don't have to retell them what my search results are. Now there's a different way of doing that where you pass in parameters to the URL. We'll talk about that later because it's more convenient. Um, but anyways, what it will do is it will say, okay, I'm going to assign them a, a, some identifier. So let's think about it as being a session ID. So this is going to identify me for at least for some amount of time as I'm interacting with the website, okay? How long a session is, that's totally up to Google to decide. Um, so they're going to set it. So they might call the cookie, the, the, uh, the name of the cookie might be SSID, okay? And then they'll have, there'll be some number. I should keep it in hex. Okay. And that's a number that I'm the only person in the world now that has that number, okay? So it's, it's some long random number uh, that's assigned specifically to me, okay? And they store that on their server, okay? So just like they have their file with all the usernames and passwords, they have a file with all their session IDs, and they might merge that information if I, if I were to log in in the future, okay? Then what they do is they want my browser to store the same information, okay? So they send my response, like I go to google.com, so they send me down, you know, the HTML website or whatever it is. So here's the actual HTML of, of whatever I asked for. And then they append to it in a header, uh, I want you to set cookie. And then they'll have the, the information, SSID equals D579. B8. Okay. Then what will happen is uh, it'll come back to me and I'll say, okay, fine. Uh, I need to store this information uh, for the future. So I'm going to make a little table and I'm going to have the origin, which is basically where did I get this cookie from? So I got it from google.com and we need to be a little more specific, like what if it's google.ca, is that the same origin as google.com? That's where we're going. But anyways, it's from google.com, whatever that means. And uh, then the cookie itself is uh, an SSID. 
a cookie called SSID with value D57968. Okay, now let's say that this is a login. So in this case, I might log in. Then what they could do is they could append this table and say, okay, uh, this person just logged in. And uh, now we know, we check their password and all that stuff, so we know their username, okay? So now when someone comes back with this number, they, they'll look it up and they'll say, okay, we know who this person is, this, this user. So let's say I go back to Google at any time. So whether I log in or not, I, I want to kind of, maybe I'll delete this. I'll just, you can sort of internalize it, but um, I, I want to show that, that cookies are used even without logins. <coughs> let's say I send a request for a new file. Uh, so I want, like, say an image uh, that was in this HTML or whatever it is. Then what my browser will say is, Oh, you're sending that request off to google.com. Hold on a second. Let me go in my cookie jar, as it's called. And I see you're about to send a packet to google.com. Do I have any cookies for google.com? And so lo and behold, I do have this one. So I'm just going to throw that in to your request. Um, so the browser will throw an SSID D5 9B. Okay, and, uh, and then that will go to Google. And then Google can say, hey, I got this request three seconds ago, and I asked them to assign this unique ID, and now I'm getting this request three seconds later, and it has this unique ID inside of it, so that must be the same person, okay? That's the same person. And then if they're logged in, it's not just, oh, it's the same person, that's pulpsby at gmail.com or whatever. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, now cookies, uh, websites can set as many cookies as they want. Okay, so they can set more than one. Uh, they can set, they just all have to have a unique name. Uh, and then there's a bunch of parameters they can set with the cookie itself that we'll, we'll go into the details of. Yep, yeah, because they recorded it. Okay, so the browser doesn't do that automatically. It's not part of how the web works. So this is totally just Google did it themselves, right? So it is kind of how Apache works. So like, like if you just run a web server, it's gonna have this functionality baked in. You don't have to like go and do a custom job in order to do it. But this technically is not, it's just like your, your, your username and password database. It's something that you're doing on the side and different websites might do it a different way. So they might call these things different names uh, and they might manage it differently and how this is managed and where it is and all that stuff could differ from company to company. Yeah, But most people are just going to use a turnkey web framework and it's going to have all this stuff built in. So when you go looking at cookies, you'll see that they often have the same name across different websites and things like that. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, consider an advanced case where I say I turn accept cookies off, okay? So what happens is I send my requests. Google says, I don't know who this person is. So they still try and create the cookie. They don't know that my cookie, I don't tell them that my cookies are off, okay? That's something between me and my browser, okay? So that's a setting in my browser. So they still try to set the cookie. So they'll send the response with the set cookie. And then what my browser will do is it will just ignore it. It will say, oh, I want to put this in the cookie jar, but the user said they didn't want it. So I'm not going to put it in the cookie jar. Then when the user sends a second request here, the browser goes looking through the cookie jar. It doesn't find anything because it didn't store it. And then it just sends its request without the cookie. And then the answer is no, Google doesn't. They at least they can't use the cookie to tell that you're the same person. They might have other ways of telling, right? Like if you're purposely trying to hide who you are. We talked about, when we talked about Tor, like you could look at IP address. These things aren't like unique identifiers, but there might be ways. I could look at what fonts you have installed and things like that. So if I really want to trace you, maybe I could, um, but, but basically the cookies won't, won't trace you. Yeah. Same thing with private browsing mode. So let's say I, I, I've been using Google for a month and I'm always sending the same ID. 
Then I turn on private browsing mode and I go to Google, then it just wipes my cookie jar. Okay, so I go to it and my browser says, I don't see any cookie that corresponds to google.com. And so it sends a request without a cookie as well. Okay, now why don't we just turn off cookies, right? Um, well, first off, maybe there's no good reason to, but I think you know by now, probably from the assignment, that the, uh, for privacy reasons, cookies aren't great. Um, because they, they, they let you, they let you trace, they can trace you anyway. So I'll, I'll show you some examples later. Um, but we could just turn off cookies, but then this basic functionality would go away. So we would go to Gmail and we would click on that first message and then it would want us to sign in again, right? It'd be like, I don't know who you are, that type of thing, okay? So cookies are kind of essential. Um, yeah, anyway, so let's save those details for later. Okay, now what if, let's say this was a login. So I sent my username, password, and Google said, okay, that's great and they send the cookie back to me. And uh, then I come, and I don't have to ever put my username and password in again, right? Or as long as this cookie lives. So Google can decide how long this cookie lives. They can say, um, it lives until the user tells me to delete it. Okay, so sometimes you click the sign out button, right? And it, like, it forgets the cookie. What happens is your browser doesn't forget your cookie. The server, Gmail, just forgets it. They might not even forget it. They might just mark it as invalid. So, so that when you come back with the same cookie, they're like, we still know who you are, but last time you signed out, so we're gonna ask you to sign in again, okay? So that's pure like server, like they can decide and do whatever they want, okay? So just because you sign out, it doesn't mean it deletes anything. Uh, it just means that the server should ask you to log in again, okay? But let's say I've already logged in and I'm still active in my session. Um, the only way that that server is identifying me is because this value is stuck at the front of my request, right? That's the only way it can tell, okay? So what if you sent a request for the first box in an inbox and you put this value at the front of your request? Would it then grab the first message out of my inbox? So the answer is yes, it would, okay? So this, this session ID is basically as good as a password, okay? So this password is what's authenticating me, or sorry, not password, this session ID is what's authenticating me to the website. It's the only thing that's authenticating me. Now, if my IP address changes completely to a different continent or something like that, they, they might have intrusion detection systems that would, would make you log in again, okay? But it's the primary thing uh, that's authenticating me. Okay, so could I guess what your session ID is? That would be a problem, right? If I could guess what your session ID is, then I could log in as you, right? Okay, um, so session IDs need to be unguessable. If you're gonna use it for authentication, sometimes you use it just to trace people around, that's fine. But if you're using it for an actual session, like in, in lieu of a username and password, they should be unguessable. Okay, so that means they're long and they're random. So one, some websites would assign them sequentially. So the first user would get one, the second user would get two, the next user. Would, so you eventually you log in a couple times, you realize what the pattern is, and then you can guess other people's sessions and hop onto their sessions, okay? This cookie is in the header of a request, and it was set in the header of a response. Now, let's go back to HTTPS, okay? Is this encrypted? Is this value encrypted or not? If I'm on the wire, I'm a man in the middle, and I see this response go by that sets the cookie, can I read what that cookie value is? Is it inside the envelope of encryption or not? Okay, so it could be either way, but it happens to be inside, okay? And it makes sense, right? If it wasn't on the inside, then we would have a problem. Okay, so it's encrypted under HTTPS. So HTTPS in general tries to encrypt everything it can, except for it can never encrypt this, the destination uh, of the packet, 
because then it then you see this thing and you're supposed to forward it to the right person and you don't know who that person is. Okay, so you always have to say where it's going, otherwise they can't get routed to the right person. But things like cookies, you don't need to know the cookie to route it properly, and so that can definitely be on the inside of the envelope. Okay, so it's encrypted under HTTPS. Now, what happens if you don't use HTTPS? Okay, then it's going to be in plain text, okay? Okay, so let's say you're Facebook and you're logging users in, but you're not using HTTPS. Does that mean that anyone that's in the middle can, can log into your Facebook account? They just pull your session ID out of the, the packet, out of the thin air, and then log in? So the answer is yes, okay? And in fact, in the early days of Facebook, they did not use HTTPS, okay? The way they worked is they used HTTPS only for your username and password. So they said, your password's really important, so we're going to transfer you to HTTPS. You'll put your username password in. It will go over SSL, right? Uh, then we'll check it and we'll log you in. But then when we log you in, we're going to return you back to HTTP, okay? The problem with it is then as you were like looking at your feed and clicking on things and moving around, it was using cookies to, to make your login persistent, to manage your session ID, right? And people understood that in theory, someone could session hijack. So this, I should write that word because it's important too. Um, so so uh, if I steal your cookie and, and then just like start putting it in front of my cookies, or like let's say I just go into my own cookie jar and I overwrite my SSID with your SSID because I saw it, then that's called session hijacking. Um, Okay, so anyways, so what they did is uh, they said, well, yeah, in theory, but like who's a man in the middle that would do that, right? Like there, there's no real man in the middle, like people, like that's, like your ISP is not gonna do it. Like technically, yeah, they could, right? Government, nah, they wouldn't do that, right? Now we know better than that. But uh, even before, uh, so what happened is someone, uh, they wrote, I don't know if I talked about this earlier when we talked about HTTPS, but if I'm repeating it, apologies. Um, but they decided, hey, we're going to make this really easy for people. So they wrote this, fi this Firefox extension called Fire Sheep. And what it would do is you would just go into any Wi-Fi network, like Starbucks or something like that. And there was a vulnerability in Wi-Fi that wasn't too severe. But basically, you could poison the routing table. And you could get everyone that's on Wi-Fi routed through your computer. So all their traffic was flowing through your computer. Now, it was encrypted. like with HTTPS if you were on HTTPS. So it shouldn't be a danger, right? It shouldn't be a problem. If, if your HTTPS traffic goes through me, then HTTPS should be protecting you from me. That's the whole point of the protocol, okay? So this routing table vulnerability wasn't considered a big deal. It let someone be a man in the middle, but it's all, you know, the traffic should be encrypted anyway, except for it wasn't, okay? So what you would do is uh, you would literally just install this extension you would connect us, you go to Starbucks and you're on the Wi Fi and you would open it up and it would just be like ping, 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 ping. Here's like five other Facebook accounts that are on, uh, that are on this Wi Fi network right now. I can see their traffic. I saw their traffic go by and I pulled their session ID out of their, uh, out of their traffic. And then you would just double click on whoever you wanted and then boom, you were into their Facebook account because uh, it would just drop the SSID. Okay, so this was theoretically possible. Facebook said, oh, that's not any news to us. Like we knew that this was theoretically a possible, but it was just because they made it so simple that like anybody could do it. And then people started doing it, right? Like for a couple of weeks, everyone was like trying out this fire sheep thing, you know, going into Starbucks and, and it was all over the news and it became this big ordeal. And then Facebook was embarrassed about it. And then what did they do? Well, they switched to HTTPS everywhere. Okay, so now everything is on HTTPS. On any, any site that you have to log into, it's now understood that you need to maintain HTTPS, not just to protect the password when it goes by, but for the whole session, because that session ID is basically as good as a password.
So now it's, I'll say it's conventional. I don't want to say every website does it because maybe there are, there are some that don't, but it's now conventional uh, for websites to always use HTTPS. For session IDs anyways. There are some cookies where you can use to track people that aren't as important, but anyways. Um, and yeah, Fire Sheep is, if you want to read about it, uh, it was a big deal when it happened, but anyways. While I'm saying that, what, what are some other things that you'd use cookies for that aren't maintaining sessions? So you can maintain sessions with them. What are some like other, like not, not so like security sensitive things? So tracking is another one. So that one is security sensitive, but it's also used. So uh, tracking and session IDs is kind of like tracking, but like with a consequence of keeping you logged in. Other things might be like, say you go to a website and there's an English or French version, right? And you click, I want English, right? And then it sticks. So like you go back to the website a couple days later and it remembered that you wanted English. How did it do that? Well, it just set a cookie. Right, it said a cookie language equals English or something like that. You came back three days later, your browser sent that cookie along and it's like, oh, this user wants English, so I'm gonna show them the English page, okay? So like little things like that are like dark mode on websites or things, yeah. You wanna change the font or the size of the website, those, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, so you can make that stuff sticky uh, by using cookies. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to redraw this diagram now. This time, we'll just walk through an example of, of logging in. Uh, so the, just, it's basically the same example, but. So let's say I go back. This will be a continuation of the previous diagram. So I go back to google.com. And I say, okay, now I want to log in. So I, I send a request, uh, which is a login. Technically, it might be a post because I'm posting my username and password, but usually it's passed in through what's called URL parameters. Um, doesn't matter. So I, I'm sending some sort of request or some sort of packet, uh, uh, which is a login packet, and it contains my username and password. And my browser says, okay, good. You're going to google.com, I check my cookie jar, and as it turns out, you do have a cookie uh, for Google. Um, B579B something, eight. I'm gonna tag that along, okay? So then Google says, okay, good. I know who this user is. They're the user that I've been interacting with a bit this morning. And because I have the username password, you know, I'm also going to, I'm going to check the password. And so I have my username password database. Because it might be a wrong password or something like that. So we can't conclude that it's the person right away. But lo and behold, I see there's this user and their password matches the password that I was just sent. Okay, so now I know that this person So now I know that this person is the same as this person. Okay, now I know that going forward. Okay, so from this point on, I now know that every time I see this cookie, I know who that person is. But I can also apply that retroactively. So even before I logged in and gave them my username, I was doing stuff on the website, like I searched different search terms, right? And Google didn't know who I was, but they did give me a unique identifier, okay? And they could have remembered all of those search, my search history, right? They just didn't know it was me. They just knew it was this user D579B8. 
So the second I log in, right, it's like now they know who I am going forward, but they also know all of the past things I did before I logged in, but I did it with that same cookie that all of that stuff belongs to me. Okay, it was all done, at least from my computer, my browser, it doesn't necessarily mean I was the human uh, that was sitting at it as well, okay? So we recognize now that these are the same people, and uh, yeah, it, it goes beyond just, you know, future interactions, but also uh, past interactions as well. Yeah. Okay, let's walk through the example. So you want a new person, like you sit down at my computer, for example? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what will happen is I first have to log out. So what Google will do is usually there's different levels of session ID. So like I'm kind of using, I'm making it sound like they just set one cookie, but they really set like a whole bunch of cookies, right? Um, so some of them are meant like for pulsebuy at gmail.com while he's logged into his inbox, right? There'll be some cookie that's only meant for that purpose. As soon as, to sign into a new account, I have to sign out of the old one. As soon as I hit that sign out, it's going to mark that cookie as invalid. Then it will give me a new cookie for the new account. But there's going to be some other cookie that's just like for all the traffic from this browser, right? So I can tie all of that information. And that's more like for tracing. It's not really a security thing. It's not meant to, to monitor your session. It's just more for tracing. And so what, what I'll see if I'm Google is I'll see two people logged in to two different accounts from the same browser. Yeah, and that's what I'll know as Google. Uh, and so that, and then what I do with that information, like maybe I infer that you live together or something like that, I don't know. Or you're, you're the same person, you have multiple accounts, I don't know what I do with it. But anyway, that's the data that I get and I can do, I can feed that into some big machine learning algorithm that's gonna tell me your income or something. Maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not. Okay, um, Okay. so then, uh, so I log in, my cookie gets affiliated with my username. Then I say, okay, give me the first message in my inbox. So I send a request for like inbox equals one. And the browser will say, okay, you're sending that off to google.com. Uh, no problem, I know who that person is. I have a cookie in my cookie jar, and so let me just attach it. And this is what Google will receive, okay? So Google will say, okay, someone's trying to request the first message in their inbox, and it's this person, D57968. Uh, so let me go look them up in my cookie table. And this could be a merged database, I'm just, uh, I'm just, for fun, I'm, I'm keeping them separate, but whatever. Uh, let me look them up. Oh, I know who that person is, and I can see that they logged in, and okay, now I know who the user is. Okay, so I know what account to pull up. I'm gonna pull up their account, and I will, uh, I'll show them whatever's inbox number one uh, for, for this particular user, okay? So this is how cookies work. This is why you don't have to put your username password in every time you wanna look at a new message in your inbox. Okay, so we talked about this already, but the user can clear cookies. Well, we said, you, first off, you can block cookies, okay? So let's start with that. So user can block cookies. And what that means is the browser won't add it to the cookie jar. Now I mentioned this a few times, just a trivia question. Uh, let's say I'm in private browser mode. So I go to private browser mode, it deletes my cookie jar. Then I go to Google, uh, Google says set a cookie. What does private browser mode do? So you don't necessarily have to know the answer, but just your best guess. Okay, okay. So the way it actually works is it, it does set the cookie for you. 
So all it does is it resets you to as if you have a blank identity, but then once you start browsing within it, it will accumulate cookies. So if you go and say, give me the English page, the website will remember that you want English. Now, as soon as you close down the private browsing mode, right, then all those cookies go away. Okay, they don't get added back to your other account, like your non-browsing, it's just, it's its own account. And when you close it, it deletes. And then you reopen private browsing mode in a new tab. You go back to that website and now it's showing you French again because it doesn't remember who you are, okay? So all it does is it deletes the cookie at the start, but it does let you collect cookies uh, as you go. And this is so that you, you don't have usability, bad usability because websites need cookies to function. Um, okay, so user can block cookies. Uh, the browser won't add it. Uh, user can clear cookies. So then your browser empties the cookie jar. And I'll note that private browsing mode also does this as well. So a lot of times, like say you just wanna debug something, like a website is, I don't know, it's being buggy or something like that, uh, you could use private browsing mode, right? Or let's say you've read your three free articles on whatever, on the, new, on the Financial Times, then you could try private browsing mode and maybe it'll let you read more. So basically all it is is it's just resetting your cookies. Okay, so your browser will empty your cookie jar. Uh, what will the servers do? If you go into your browser setting and say clear all my cookies, do they get deleted off all the servers around the world that have your cookies? It couldn't possibly. Right, like there, there's no possible way that that could happen, okay? So server does not change. So they still have your cookie. But the idea is that they won't recognize you when you come back, probably. But then let's say you go back to Google and you log in, right? Then they're like, oh, we know, we know who you are. Like, right, so, so anyway, so all it does is it, it empties your cookie jar, so your cookie, your browser's gonna stop putting that cookie in, okay? Now cookies can expire. And we'll see this a little later when we, we look in. Uh, it could be by date or it could be by session, which in this case means browser session. So when I close my browser window. Uh, so the browser will, will do this, will maintain, manage this. So if it says, oh, there, I see that there's a, a cookie here for Google, I'm about to send it, but wait, let me check the date. Oh no, that expired, right? Then it, will, it won't send it, okay? Now, this is set, both of these, the date and the session, if, if you want it to, to die with the session, meaning as soon as I close my browser, it dies. Uh, in both of these cases, this is set when you create the cookie, okay? So the expiration date, is put into the cookie value itself. I was going to try and show you on the diagram, but the scrolling's all messed up. Okay, so when we set the cookie here, this is when we set the expiration. So who's choosing the expiration date for the cookie? Who's doing the setting of this? So the server, okay, so it's the server's uh, setting the request. Now you can also set your browser to forget like every day or I would forget my cookies every day, forget them every week, forget them every time I close my browser, whatever. Um, so you can also, uh, you can set it with the browser as well. So and this will just clear the cookie jar. So I can set it on a timer or whatever I want to clear my cookie jar every now and then. Uh, this is set by the server. Now let's say that the cookie expires. Does that mean the server deletes it? Not necessarily, okay? They shouldn't, they're probably not gonna honor it. Like there was a reason they put that expiration date, 
uh, but they might still keep it just to know that you're the same person, even if they're not going to honor it. Now, what if you say, like, log me out after seven days? How, who enforces that you actually get logged out after seven days? Or like there's sometimes there's like always keep me logged in. Let's say you don't click that box. So you just log in, but you don't click it, right? Okay, so the server is going to maintain it. Your browser doesn't know that. It's just, to the browser, it's just HTML, okay? So the browser has no idea. This is all on the server. The server could do it one of two ways. It could put it in the cookie itself if it wanted to. So if it's like, oh, this person wants a session cookie, let me just give them a session cookie, then I don't have to remember to delete it myself later. Or it could mark it in its cookie table. Hey, the user logged in at this time. It's good for six hours. And then if it comes back to its cookie table and looks that cookie up and sees that it expired, then it, it behaves accordingly, okay? But the point is it's out of the user's control. So whether, let's say you, you don't click that button, but it keeps you logged in anyways, like the, the, the functionality isn't there. That's not because your browser screwed up, that's because the server screwed up. Okay, that, that was, that's all on the server. So if the server says, I'm not gonna keep you logged in, that's a promise that they're making to you and maybe they do it, maybe they don't. Um, that's, it's totally within, there's no technical enforcement of, of those kinds of things. Okay, uh, any questions about any of this? Probably not, because uh, Google won't know. Let, let's say no, because uh, they, they'll have no idea who you are, and they can't assign potentially someone different than you the same session ID, otherwise they're going to get your sessions mixed up. So yeah, you'll get a, a new, unique session ID. Other questions? Okay, let's pause here, uh, and during the break, I'll, I'm going to pull up a couple of websites and and uh, and uh, and then we can look at cookies and see what they actually look like. So, but we'll do that in about ten minutes. Okay, so let's. Uh, I'll show you an example of what this looks like. So I went over to tsn.ca. Uh, this is the kind of website that might have a lot of different kind of tracking cookies and things like that. Um, also wanted to check in on the scores, so if anyone cares, Argentina and Mexico won their games. Uh, anyways, okay. So you can do this yourself. Uh, so you just enable uh, uh, browser tools. You know, almost all browsers have it. It almost always looks the same. Um, and so uh, the other thing that uh, can happen is uh, your browser settings will cause, obviously, the behavior of this to, to change, right? So for example, if I block all cookies, then I shouldn't expect to see any cookies. So let's start in that situation. So uh, here you can see uh, cookies that are, are listed here. And uh, every time the website tries to set a cookie, so there's that request to set it, it does display it. So it does tell me that tv1.tsn.ca is trying to set a cookie. And then here it shows me the cookie that it actually stored. So in this case, it's just empty. So I do get a list of, of cookies that it's trying to set. Um, but, but anyways, it's not actually setting those cookies because I, I turn, turn the cookies off, okay? Now you can see some of them are from TSN. That's what we expect. We're on TSN's website. They're gonna, uh, they're gonna send some cookies. Uh, some of them are from doubleclick.net. Has anyone heard of that? So this is a tracker. Uh, it's used on lots and lots of websites. Uh, it's mainly meant to serve you ads. Okay, so this is, uh, see up here, odds by FanDuel, that's an ad. Uh, and so perhaps I went to FanDuel at some previous time and it says, oh, I know who that person is. I'm gonna show them the ad for FanDuel because they, they're a user or whatever, okay? In this case, that's not what's happening because there's no cookies uh, being sent. But anyways, uh, Google, uh, lots of websites use Google, something like around 75% of websites use some Google likes to give you tools that, that allow you to do stuff. Uh, you can search engine optimize your website and things like that. You can see who your users are, what search terms were they using, all of that stuff Google gives to you. They give it to you, but you have to run JavaScript on your uh, website in order for that to work. 
and Google is also consuming that information. So they, they're giving it to you, but it's useful for Google as well, because if they know who I am based on my cookie ID and TSN is using Google, then guess what? Google knows I went to TSN. Okay. Uh, Snapchat, right? Social media, uh, and then Moat, as I assume is some ad thing, uh, Google. So anyway, these are, this is the kind of stuff that you see. Uh, now I'm going to turn off block all cookies, but I still have what's called percent prevent cross-site tracking. So we'll uh, we'll talk about that in a second. The other thing you might notice is that websites load slowly over time. So even though you get the main content of the website, often there's like advertisements and things like that that kind of run in the background. Trackers and stuff like that, they're, it's kind of like TSN doesn't want to stop you from experiencing the website because they're waiting on some JavaScript from some tracker, right? So they're going to load the website first. They're going to give you the best user experience. And if you stick around long enough for them to load in a bunch of trackers, then that's fine. That's great. Then they'll, they'll load them in, OK? Um, so now you can see uh, we, have, um, we have the same kind of list. And now you can see actually what these cookies look like. So I'm hesitant to put this on YouTube, but someone might log into my TSN account. I actually will not click on the Google account just in case. Um, but uh, the TSM one, I don't care that much about. Uh, so anyway, so, so you can see what a cookie looks like, OK? So there's a cookie here. It's called underscore CB. So this is the name of the cookie. Uh, you can see the value. Uh, and it looks like a big, long string, uh, just like we said. This is the domain that sent the cookie, so .tsn.ca. We're going to dissect this a bit, but the dot means that it's, uh, it's a cookie that would get sent back to anytime you go to TSN or if you go to a subdomain of TSN. So say you went to video.tsn.ca, it would also go along. Uh, the path name will also dictate when you send the cookie or not. Uh, there's an expiration date. Uh, so most of them expire in a couple days, it looks like. Um, some of them are session, marked as session. So as soon as I close my browser, these should disappear. Uh, there's the size of the cookie, not that important. And then there's some fields like secure, HTTP only, and same site. And we'll, we'll talk about these because these are kind of important fields. Uh, secure should obviously, you should obviously think that sounds important since it's a security course. Um, but before we do, let me uh, just, oh yeah, let me, uh, so I can show you uh, for like optimizely or double click, you know, they're trying to set cookies, but they're not being able to set the cookies yet. And that's because I had uh, cross, prevent cross site tracking turned on, okay? So what this setting does is it basically says, I'm on tsn.ca, it's fine for tsn.ca to set cookies, uh, but I don't want other websites setting cookies while I'm on, on this website, okay? Now, sometimes that's a problem, specifically with TSN, okay? If I log into TSN, uh, I actually don't log in through TSN. They don't manage their login. TSN is owned by Bell Canada. And so Bell Canada has a, a login that's hosted on Bell Media. Okay, I know this from firsthand experience. Crave is the same way, so if you watch HBO shows. Um, if you go and you log into TSN, it will redirect you to Bell Media. You'll put your username and password into Bell Media. It will check it and it will say, yes, that's, that's Jeremy, that's the right password. And then it will redirect me back to TSN. But because I have prevent cross-site tracking, that session ID cookie can't come along for the ride. So it will redirect me, and then TSN will see, well, I don't see a session ID, right? And then it, it will just be like, oh, you're still logged out, right? And Crave is the same. But if I go into my browser setting, I turn off prevent cross-site scripting, then I can log in, and then it transfers me back, and I'm logged in on TSN. Then I can click it on again. Because the cookie's set, right? I don't need to persist. And then I can keep it on until I get logged out invariably. Uh, and, th and then I have to go through that process again. So anyway, so prevent cross-site scripting. Used to be called prevent third-party cookies. Um, so it's the same, same idea. Uh, but now we can reload it. And now all the cookies should sort of uh, fill in. Okay, so we have a bunch of cookies for TSN. Uh, a bunch of other stuff are, is coming in. 
you can see also when I turned it off, like I'm getting a lot more cookies. Um, so this one didn't actually send it, set it. Yeah, so some of these third parties are setting them. I, d I don't know why it's empty in some of the other cases. They're, they're not being set. Um, I suspect it might be that uh, um, it's maybe this thing, uh, web advertising. So I think Apple says, oh, moat ads. I know what that is. That's an advertisement. Um, so I can actually try and turn off all of these settings, and then we should hopefully get a full, a full boatload of cookies. Yeah, so anyways, I, I don't know why I, I have to investigate it, but I'm not seeing cookies in, in all of the domains that are trying to set them. But anyways, you can definitely see some third-party uh, cookies that are being set uh, by different, um, different domains other than TSN itself. Okay, uh, so let's take a screenshot of this for the notes, and then we'll dissect it a bit. So, these are all the websites that are trying to set a cookie or origins. Just when I go to tsn.ca. Uh, then notice I, I have focus on tsn.ca, so it's only showing me tsn's cookies. It's not showing me everything else. Okay, um, so this is the name of the cookie. So you can call it whatever you want. The website can call it whatever they want. This is the value that's assigned to the cookie. So if it's some sort of session ID, it should be a long, random, hard to guess number. Uh, if it's some property like, do I want French on this website? It could be like just in English, like true. You can see one cookie here is set for true. So this will be some setting. CC, maybe closed captioning. So like on videos, do I want closed captioning or not? Uh, whenever, I, by default, it's set for true. If I ever turn it off, then it gets set to false. I don't know. That's a guess. But anyways, uh, previous equals four. So sometimes these values have like kind of meaning that's interesting in the context. Okay. The domain in this case will be when it should be sent back. Actually, the path and the domain are both answers to this question. When should the browser send this cookie? OK? And it's up to the website to decide this, OK, With, within some confines uh, of the rule. So uh, if I'm at tsn.ca, I can only create a cookie for tsn.ca, OK? I can't create a cookie for some other website. So that's why Bell Media couldn't just create a tsn cookie, because it wasn't tsn itself. So the browser is only going to accept cookies that uh, were sent from a response from the actual server itself, OK? Now, why, why, how is it that Google's trying to set a cookie then if I went to tsn.ca? Well, it's because I actually went to Google. So like TSN brought me down an HTML file and said, go over to Google and ask for this JavaScript. So I went over to Google, I asked for it, and Google in their response from that server 
sent this cookie along for the ride, okay? So these cookies are coming from these actual websites. It's just that when I weave together all the content of this website, I'm weaving it together with, with content from all of these different servers. So I, I requested something from all of these servers by visiting tsn.ca. And when they came back with a response, they said, oh, by the way, I want you to set this cookie, okay? Um, now in the future, when should I send it? Uh, so I, I can send it to my own domain. And then I have a basic choice of, do I want to send it to a subdomain? So should it just be for tsn.ca or should it be for any subdomain of tsn.ca? And maybe I want to scope it to a specific subdomain. So for example, let's say I go to Gmail, it's at mail.google.com. Maybe I want to set a cookie that's only for mail.google.com. So if the user goes over to images.google.com, that cookie isn't sent, right? Then I would scope it, I would set the domain to images.google.com. Now, or sorry, I would set it to um, mail.google.com. Now maybe there's subdomains of mail.google.com, right? Like images.mail.google.com or something like that. And I want to allow those, right? Then I would put dot Im or dot mail.google.com. Um, so let me try and write this down because I'm saying words not very well. Um, I, I'll, I'll actually walk through a full, I'll walk through a full example in a second. The other thing I can do is I can scope it to a path name. So I can say, okay, if the user's coming back to mail.google.com slash inbox, send this cookie. But if they're coming back to mail.google.ca uh, slash settings, don't send this cookie. Okay. Now the path domain is almost never used. I, I actually have never seen in all the years I've taught this course, I always grab screenshots and I've never seen anyone set the path to me. So it, basically it's never used, but it is there, it's available to you if you wanna say only send it to a specific path, uh, which is something after uh, the, the slash, then you can do that, okay? This is when the browser will stop sending. So it's up to the browser to look at this date or did the session end, that kind of thing and then it will stop sending it. Size doesn't really matter. Then we have a couple fields here, uh, secure, HTTP only, and same site. Uh, let me, I'll just talk about the first two. Don't, you don't have to worry about the same site. Okay, what do we think, does anyone have a guess at what these things mean? So secure flag, so you can see it's set for some of them and HTTP only. Now this is also when, all, all of this stuff has to do with when the browser should send this cookie in the future, okay? So the browsers, you, you go back to the same website, I go back to TSN tomorrow, and the browser's looking at this cookie and it's saying, okay, I have this cookie called chartbeat2, should I be sending this today or not? Okay, well I can see it's not expired, so that's fine, but it's marked secure or it's not marked secure. So, so how's that going to influence my decision about whether to send it or it's marked HTTP only? Okay, so some of this is going to have to do with HTML or sorry, HTTPS, right? So sometimes you want a cookie like a session ID and you don't want it sent over an unencrypted channel. Okay, so that's what the secure flag is going to mean. It's going to say only send over HTTPS. Okay, uh, now what, what do we think about HTTP only? Is that kind of the opposite? Only send it if it's not HTTPS? So it is, we're only going to send it when it's HTTP. Okay, so it's not HTTP as opposed to HTTPS. It's HTTP as opposed to JavaScript asking for a connection to be opened, okay? So if the website uses standard, it actually doesn't matter, it could be HTTP or HTTPS, but if it uses a standard request or post, then this cookie will get sent along. But if there's JavaScript that's running in the website and the JavaScript says, hey, go over to ads.google.com and grab this for me, th that request looks different. Requests that, that originate from JavaScript look different than your browser making the request. 
And so what this flag will do is it will only send the cookie if the browser makes a request, but not if, if JavaScript makes it. Yeah, so everything is within the browser, and furthermore, it's within the website itself, right? So let's say I download a website, and it says, go load this image. Like, the image doesn't come down with the website. There's a URL there. It says, go grab the image from this, right? That's a packet that the browser makes. So the browser makes that request, and it sends it out, right? Now, I could do the same functionality within JavaScript. So I could write JavaScript, and I could say, go open a SOX connection to this URL. Right? And, and then like the image is going to come back and I'm going to somehow handle that. Right? So I, I can make that kind of request, um, but it's going to look different than when the browser does it itself. Yeah. So it's just because it's passed up from, it's passed up from the JavaScript. JavaScript packages it itself. It hands it to the browser and says, and the browser hands it to the operating system. So everything flows to the browser anyways. And that's why the browser is looking at it, trying to decide, hey, should I put this cookie on it? So the browser's holding it, right? So it, it, it knows, it's not like the JavaScript's doing something that the browser isn't aware of it. It's just that the browser knows this came from JavaScript. That's the, the best way of thinking about it without going into the technical details. So the browser's looking at this request and it says, this came from JavaScript. Should I treat it differently than if it didn't come from JavaScript, right? And there's some occasions where you might want that behavior, but as you can see, it's not very popular, right? Like nobody, Nobody has this here kind of thing. Okay. Um, so basically it says, you know, do not send if request is from JavaScript. So the ones that don't, those cookies would get sent. Uh, so this cookie, for example, if I go to http.tsn.ca, it will send the cookie. And if I go to HTTPS, it will also send the cookie. And the check mark says, don't send it if it's over HTTP, but do send it if it's over HTTPS. Yeah. OK. Uh, now, let me go through the domains and subdomains and paths and things like that. I'll, I'll just draw an example because it's there's a lot of different combinations. So the domain field is basically the same as the origin. So when we talk about same origin, we mean the same domain. Okay. Um, and so we use that here when we set a cookie, we specify the domain where it should be sent back. And uh, uh, so it's, it's, let me put it this way. I can switch back to normal color. Okay, so the domain is also the same thing as the origin for all purposes. So it's set by the server in cookie, and then it's referenced by the browser when sending a new packet. Oh, write a request. So every time you send a request, you go all through your cookie jar and you say, what cookie can I put uh, in front of this request? This one, no. This one, I can't because it's not secure. This one, it's not the right domain. Oh, yeah, this one, I can. You know, and, and so it, that's the process that your browser does. Okay. Um, so let's say, for example, we're at encs.concordia.ca. Okay, so this is the site we are visiting. Therefore, it's the site that's setting the cookie. Uh, 
uh, let's go through all the options. Okay, so it could set it for encs.concordia.ca. Okay, now let's say that the user goes to say images later, the user goes to images.concordia.ca. Would this cookie get sent or not? Okay, so I, I'll just do this quickly. Um, it's kind of boring and tedious. Uh, so no, they're not the same domain, so it's not going to send it, okay? Uh, if the user goes to encs.concordia.ca, it's the same domain, so that's fine. If the user goes to just concordia.ca, do we think that this cookie would get sent or not? No, okay, so it won't because they're basically saying, I only want it for this subdomain. I don't want it for some super domain. Now, what about a subdomain of the subdomain? So let's say I go to images.concordia, sorry, uh, images.encs.concordia.ca. Okay, should it should the cookie go or not? Okay, so maybe maybe it shouldn't. Uh, what they'll say is, you can tell us whether you want to by either putting a dot in front or not. Okay, if you put a dot in front, that's like a wild card, and it says any subdomain is allowed. And if you don't put the dot, then it's not allowed. Okay, so here let's do the example without the dot. Then we're going to say this isn't allowed. Okay, but alternatively, now all of these things you can imagine wanting. You're the developer, you have a cookie, you get the user to log in on encs.concordia.ca because that's where they happen to be when they log in, right? But you want them logged in across Concordia, right? You want them on subdomains, you want them on super domains, right? You want to see this. So all of these, are, it's quite reasonable that you might want it. Now, uh, another example that's just kind of too stupid to, to put in, but we should actually put in for completeness. If I'm at facebook.com, is this cookie going to get set? that's scoped to ENCS, obviously not, right? So that, that kind of thing isn't, isn't going to happen. Okay, completely different domain. Um, but, but so you're not going to fix this problem probably, uh, but, but you could imagine websites where you might want to share your cookies across all these different things, okay? And so that's why the domain parameter is a parameter. You're allowed to choose it any way you want, okay? So let's say that we want to admit subdomains. Uh, then what I can do is I can set dot encs dot concordia dot ca i'm allowed to do that as encs dot concordia so encs dot concordia dot ca is allowed to set dot encs dot concordia dot ca and then in this case it will go to all subdomains including images dot encs dot concordia dot ca And it will continue to go if there's no subdomain. So an empty subdomain is fine as well. But if I go up to a super domain or if I go to a different domain like images or just concordia.ca, those will continue not to work. Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, I'll just put the one example in, but the other one, I'll just say in words. So if you go to images. Dot, sorry, if you go to Ian's, if you go to images.concordia.ca, that's not either encs.ca or a subdomain of it, so it's not going to work. Okay. Now, what if I want? I want the user, I want to share this cookie across images.concordia.ca and I want to share it with concordia.ca. Can I do that? First off, how would I do it semantically? Like what would I write if I want to share it with all of Concordia and all of Concordia subdomains? So I'm going to write .concordia.ca. 
Now, does my browser let me do that? Yes. Okay, so .encs.concordia.ca can create a cookie and tell the browser, don't just send it back when the user comes back to ENCS or any subdomain, actually send it back to any domain of concordia.ca, okay? So that's allowed. So you are allowed to create a cookie that has a broader scope than you. Um, and that's, you might think that that's like, like you might question that, right? Because often like, a, like within Concordia, the encs.concordia.ca, that's probably in the engineering department. That machine is physically in the engineering department. But concordia.ca, that machine could be somewhere else, right? And so why should the machine that's here be able to set cookies for, or have like cookies that are, are set for the other machine? So, but anyways, it's common enough that you wanna move around uh, between subdomains that that browser said, we gotta, we gotta let developers do this, okay? So developers should be allowed to do this if they want. And so then, yeah, if you go to, actually, so users.encs.concordia.ca, that kind of thing works, images, dot concordia that should work uh, whatever just concordia itself should work canada.ca shouldn't work now what if concordia really wanted to share their cookies like ENCS or Gina Cody now, Gina Cody is allowed to share their cookies with all of Concordia. Okay, could Concordia then share its cookies with all of .ca? Anyone who has a .ca account? Okay, so I'll just come along and I'll say, okay, I have this cookie. I want you to send it back anytime you have a .ca. Okay, so this is not allowed. There's, there's no reason like like it could like there's no technical reason it just would be a disaster right developers wouldn't know what they're doing they would set domain these super domain cookies and it would get sent to like literally every website it would clog things up and it, it would just be a, a disaster okay so this is this allowed by browser policy And if you're concordia.ca and you want to share your thing with canada.ca, you could just say, okay, forget about sharing it with all of .ca. Just, you know, let me share it with canada.ca, maybe it's subdomains. So can a website from one domain set a cookie for another website? And the answer is no. So we disallow this because they're different origins. They're not the same origin. Okay, and then for path, I'll just mention it, even though it's it's basically never used. I'll say rarely used. So let's say that I'm on the website uh, users.encs.concordia.ca slash Tilda Clark. So this is the website that's sending, setting the cookie. So for my website itself, I could set a cookie that's scoped to say users.encs.concordia.ca. So that's fine. Uh, and I could set the path if I wanted to, to, you know, slash tilde Clark. Okay, so these things are fine. I can set these up. Now, if the user comes back and they go to users.concordia, so this is the set, set cookie. And then this is the decision. So the user is going to users. Uh, Sorry, I forgot the ENCS unintentionally.
slash m manon. I don't know why you'd ever want to go there, but let's say the user wanted to. Uh, would the cookie get sent? The answer is no. Okay, so I could scope cookies that are only to my website, uh, and they wouldn't be shared uh, with other users. Okay, so let's sort of summarize uh, what's going on. Okay, so let's say a user, they go to a server, they get, I'm not gonna show it, but they request something, and then let's just jump in where they're, they're getting their response back. So the response is coming back. We're gonna set a cookie. So that's fine. Then I take the response, and I'm looking at it, say it's a HTML file, and it's like, okay, go, go do an image, go grab this image from here, go grab this JavaScript from here, go grab this ad from here. That's the kind of thing that happens, okay? So what that's going to do is it's gonna create a whole bunch of requests. Now these requests are all going to different places. So these requests are all, um, they're all like kind of independent. Okay, so we'll just think of them as separate requests. They all will get packaged. They're not gonna get bundled together because they're, they're all going to different destinations so they all have to be their own packet, right? Same way if you, if you mail something to 10 different people, they all have to be in there. You can't put all 10 things in the same envelope and have it go around to the 10 people, right? You're gonna mail it to each of them in, independently. Okay. So the response will create all of these requests and they'll all be going to somewhere slightly different. And your browser is going to say, okay, I need to look in my cookie jar for each of these. And I have to see, should I send this cookie? Okay. Should this cookie be put with this request? Should it be put with this request? Should it be put with this request? Or should it be put with this request? Not just this cookie, but any cookie in the cookie jar. So I might decide, you know, for example, for the first request, it's going to the same origin and I checked out the domains and all of that stuff and it's all, and it's marked secure and it's a secure connection, whatever, it meets the criteria uh, so I'm going to put the cookie into this request. But the second one, that, that's not secure and it was the cookie was marked secure. It's at a different subdomain. It's not scoped correctly. So I'm not gonna put the cookie in that request. And then this one, it's fine. It matches. So I put the cookie here. And then the last one, I don't know, maybe stays blank. Okay, so this is your cookie policy. And at a high level, that's what it's doing. It's just, it's looking at every single request, it's looking at every cookie it has, and it's trying to decide whether it's going to, if it's going to include those cookies or not, okay? And the criteria it uses is basically, um, so for, every request, so if you have 100 requests, you're going to do this 100 times. And every cookie in the cookie jar. So let's say we have 500 cookies and we have 10 requests. We're going to do something uh, 5,000 times, okay? So every request is going to get run through every 500 cookies. Um, so for every request and every cookie in the cookie jar. <coughs> we're going to ask ourselves this. Okay, so does the domain match? We'll say does the destination of the request 
match the domain of the cookie. Is it still valid, meaning it's not expired? And uh, do the flags, like the HTTPS and secure only in the secure flags, do they allow me to send it? Okay, so if the answer is yes, 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 then we prepend cookie to request. And then we keep going, okay? So then we look at the next cookie and we look at the next cookie. So uh, any requests, one request could have 20 cookies that are prepended to it or whatever. Um, so. In the example, we saw all those TSN ones would get sent back the next time we go to TSN. So your, the number of cookies that you include can be quite big, kind of. Okay, now you've heard that cookies have privacy implications, right? And so we're starting to get maybe a feel for why these are dangerous, but let's just be explicit about it. Um, so how can we use cookies to trace people? Okay, so I go to TSN and I send my request. And TSN says, whatever, let's ignore TSN's cookies. Um, but they, they probably would set their own cookies, but let's, we can ignore it. And in that response, I open it up and it says, you know, you need to go over to Google and you need to download this JavaScript from Google, right? Um, so then what my browser will do is it will go over to google.com. And it will say, I have a request, you know, I want whatever script.js, ads.js or something like that, okay? And what Google will say is, hey, you know, let's assume that the user, you know, they just enabled private browsing mode or they just bought a brand new computer. So there's no cookies anywhere. Okay, so it's the start of the world, fresh world. Uh, Google will say, okay, uh, I don't know who you are. I've never seen you before. I don't see any cookies in your request. So let's take care of that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna assign you a cookie. And because we're not logging in, this has nothing to do with login, it's just about tracking. I'm gonna call it a UID, a user ID instead of a session ID, just so it's less confusing, okay? So let's say UID equals, I'll just keep it short, 55. Um, so I'm gonna set this cookie. And then I'm going to send the actual response as well, right? So I'll send down the JavaScript file, but I'm just going to prepend this uh, to the front of that. And this is going to include all of the parameters as well. Uh, so my browser will store everything that you saw. So it's not just the value. I'm just showing the value, the name and the, the value, uh, but it's going to store the expiry date date, the, the actual domain requirements and things like that. So I'm going to simplify this a bit. But anyways, so here's my cookie jar. I have, I don't know, something for TSN. And then now I have this Google cookie. Uh, and I'll set it to 55. So UID equals 55.
and whatever other coins I have. Okay, then whatever, I go to sleep and I wake up the next day, so a day goes by. Or maybe I do it right away, it doesn't matter. Um, so this is, okay, then I decide, hey, now I'm going to uh, go to some web form Actually, no, let, let's go shopping. So let's say I go where, whatever, I go to chapters.ca. And chapters.ca says, okay, great. Here's your website back. And chapters will probably set its own cookie. But I'm going to ignore that uh, for a second. And uh, I'm just going to draw it down here. So. Okay, so the response is coming back to the same user. I'm just drawing the user down here, make space. And we open up the response, and the response says, oh, hey, you need to go load this library from google.com, this ad library. Okay, and uh, Google says, or sorry, your browser says, okay, I'm gonna create this request for this. Uh, just, like, just like yesterday, uh, we need to get this script js okay but i'm about to send something to google.com so i better go into my cookie jar and see you know is is there any cookies here that i need to prepend to this request okay so it will go through its cookie jar and it'll see oh there is this google cookie here uh, i better throw that in as well so this will be uid equals 55 and then Google says, thank you very much. I know who you are. I don't have to send it. I don't have to set any more cookies, uh, but here's the JavaScript that you were asking for. You know, go ahead and run it. Okay, then I go and uh, I say, okay, I wanna read the news. So I go over to cbc.ca. Same idea, I send a response. They send back a request. Let me keep just drawing the user in a new location. I look inside the request and the request says, oh, hey, we run some JavaScript from Google. You better go over and get that. Okay, and this time I'm requesting an ad, ad.js from Google. Uh, and my browser again, it says, oh, you're about to go to Google. It, it actually did this here, I didn't say it, but when I went to CBC, it, it went through my cookie jar as well and said, okay, is there a cookie for CBC? I don't have one, so it didn't prepend anything to it. Say again? Uh, yeah, sorry, response, this should be response. Or sorry, uh, this should be response, yeah. This is request and this is response. And this one's request, yeah, thank you. Okay, look good. So I'm gonna include UID equals 55, okay. And okay, so Google receives this. So it's like, okay, this user, they're on cbc.ca, they wanna see an ad, their cookie is 55. Have I ever seen this user before? Have they? Okay, so they saw them. Where, where did they last see them? At Chapters, okay. So are they gonna show you an ad for Chapters? Say Chapters, they're like, we, Chapters is one of our advertisers. They advertise with us, right? Uh, we, we can fill in any ad that we want, and if the person clicks on it, then CBC's gonna give us money, or whatever, or we're gonna get money to, yeah, we're gonna give money to CBC to advertise. And if someone clicks on it, then Chapters is gonna to have to pay us 
right? Because they, they someone clicked on it, right? Um, so they're gonna be like, okay, this user was just at chapters, let's show them the ad for chapters, right? As opposed to an ad for um, something else, uh, for .ca, okay? But if I was on a car website and they knew that, then they would show me the advertisement for Ford, okay? So that's basically how tracking works, okay? So this is a third-party tracker. I actually kind of did this, I shouldn't have had you go to Google, actually no, I, did, I didn't. Um, yeah, sorry, okay, so they're, they're a third-party tracker. You never explicitly went to google.com, okay? The user never typed in www.google.com, right? They went to TSN, this thing happened in the background that they didn't even know, right? They didn't even know that they picked up a cookie from Google. Then they went over to chapters, right? Then they went over to CBC, and now all of a sudden CBC is showing them ads for TSN and for chapters, right? And they're sitting there thinking, why, why is that? How is the CBC know, like does CBC run chapters or, or are they run by the same parent company or something? Or like, how is it, right? And this is what everyday users experience and they're confused by it like that. And it, it doesn't just have to be like an ad for chapters. It could be the exact book that you were looking at, right? You're on chapters website, you were looking at a particular book and then later you're on CBC and it's like, oh, like you should go read this book, right? Um, and so all that works basically because these websites, the first party website has a third party that's in common, okay? Because Google's on all of these. Now, if TSN used ad, like double click, and chapters use Google and CBC use Facebook, then you couldn't track the user across all of them, okay? So the reason it works is A, you have a third party tracker, and B, that same third-party tracker is on a lot of different websites, okay? And what's dangerous about things like Google and Facebook is that something like 75% of websites have Google on them, okay? Uh, and so a, a website like that is very powerful and they can track you across like 75% of the websites. I, I think there was a study, the Alexa top a million domains or something. They went to every single one and they wrote down what trackers they saw. Okay, now browsers are fighting back, so you saw some of those privacy settings in the browser, and so the browser might not always send the cookies. Okay, so it's going to make some decisions, and it depends on whether browsers consider Google an advertiser or not, and uh, so there's some stuff that's set in the policy itself. So maybe these cookies wouldn't get sent in all cases, depending on what your settings are, um, but by default, if you don't, I shouldn't say by default, but if you gave the most permission to your browser to use cookies, then this would happen, you know, regardless. Okay, uh, questions about this? Um, so I just yeah. have something on your slides. You mentioned that uh, different parts of the web can be viewed by the search and the user. Mm -hmm. uh, and we define uh, how this is defined. Are you going to talk about the exact uh, cookies? Okay, okay. So this class we talked just about cookies, and uh, next class we'll, we'll talk about that particular problem. So that's the sort of the second component. So um, the, the, so, so anyway, so this class was just about the cookie policy here. And then uh, next class, uh, we'll talk about scripting. It applies to more, like we'll, we'll talk about images and stuff like that, but scripting is the main one, right? I have some script and it's running, let's say I load script from Apple, or sorry, from Google, and I load a script from Facebook. Right? So now I have my website, Concordia. I'm running Facebook JavaScript and I'm running Google JavaScript. Can Google talk to Facebook? Can Facebook talk to Google? Can Google overwrite my website? Like all those kinds of questions. Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's the, the other part of the policy. Okay, okay, good, good point. Um, so let's say that, that all these requests to Google, instead of we requesting script.java, let's say we requested logo.jpg. But, but the, the logo is being hosted on Google's website. So all we do is we go to Google and, and like the website wants to have Google's logo on it somewhere. I don't know why, okay? TSM wants to have Google's logo. And so it just sends us over to Google's server because who else better to get that image from? And then Google sends it back. Could you still do this third-party tracking if that was the case? Just guess. 
Yes, okay, and you're right. So the answer is yes. So the fact that these are all JavaScripts, actually, that's just, I was trying to make it more realistic because usually ads are passed around using JavaScript, but it has nothing to do with JavaScript at all. So you could just be getting the same image from Google on TSN, and then it sets a cookie. It's allowed to do that. You ask for an image, right? It can set a cookie. Uh, and then when you go back to chapters.ca and it asks for the same image or another image or just anything from Google's domain, anything at all, that cookie's coming along for the ride, right? Uh, and then um, later when you go to cbc.ca, it's the same thing. So yeah, so they can track you across all websites as long as you request one, one resource from them. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be JavaScript, it could be an image or whatever. Now if they're gonna show you an ad, right, then it needs to be, the response needs to be an image or, or a thing like that. So they can, tra they can trace you with any, any content at all. And um, a lot of times when you explicitly want to do this tracing, you just send a very small packet. Like you don't even ask for anything. You're just like, you just hit the URL. It's just like a ping basically to that URL. It's just enough to register that that, that, that user was going to it. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. Um, here, let me. Uh, this could change, and it would still be the exact same scenario. Yeah, I would still set this cookie. And this could change. As long as there's a request, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I'm requesting. As long as there's any request to Google.com, then, uh, then this cookie will get prepended to it, and Google will see it as a result, yeah? And then similarly here, what I'm requesting is irrelevant. It's just, I, I need to request something or I need to interact somehow with it. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, good. Other questions? Okay, good. All right, so uh, next class we'll, uh, we'll talk about the, the scripting and how to isolate scripts on a website.